Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Welcome back to the programme. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Sarah Wilkinson. Sarah, you've been a keen observer of the Middle East and an activist for human rights on behalf of the Palestinians for many, many years. Uh, I hate to have to say it, but the current situation, both in the West Bank and obviously particularly in Gaza, uh, is surely the worst of our lifetimes, isn't it? Absolutely. I'm glad you said that because I felt I was the only one saying it. This um, genocide, yeah, is certainly the worst in my lifetime. And, you know, there have been other genocides, but never before do we have a succession of real-time footage that comes into our phones. We have witnessed this real-time, so that makes it the worst genocide of our lifetime. In Rafah, they are bracing, literally, for death as this uh, impending um, final clamp down and the, the, the bombing is going to continue in Rafah where they've literally got nowhere to hide, they've got nowhere to run. So uh, the, the situation across the whole of Gaza is catastrophic, but Rafah is the, the final point, the final refuge. And they are literally bracing themselves for something imminent. Um, and the United Nations has been very weak about saying, oh, this will cause untold consequences across the um, the region, which is an extraordinarily weak statement of lip service. Um, you know, there's 1.9 million Palestinians now uh, huddling in a very tiny area in Rafah, waiting to be bombed, literally, um, with no uh, sign of the world stepping in to prevent it. So yes. No, I I I, I hear you, and, and it seems um, that uh, you know on an almost daily basis there are fresh atrocities. Any one of which, in the ordinary course of events, uh, would be headline news, or at least certainly should be headline news. They would certainly be headline news if they were happening the other side of the border in Israel, for example. Uh, Israeli snipers have killed at least 21 Palestinians after they opened fire on displaced civilians trying to reach the Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis. Uh, I'm quoting Al Jazeera's Hani Mahmoud, who said today that snipers had surrounded the hospital and are shooting at every moving object as people try to reach it. I mean, this is off the this is off the charts cruelty. I mean. This has nothing to do with eliminating Hamas. This is just no. simply murder for the sake of murder. It, it is. And uh, we know that, you know, it, there was a doctor who was literally on uh, doing a surgery in the operating room and he was shot in the chest by a sniper while he was operating on a patient. So then he then becomes a critical patient himself. So this targeting of displaced people uh, trying to seek shelter in hospitals and also targeting patients. We, we know that a boy was shot in the head um, who was literally in intensive care and couldn't move. So these these are not uh, combatants. These are not people that, that impose any threat. So, you you know, this this genocide is literally about wiping out as many Palestinian people as possible and children and medics. And the, the medics and the hospital and the healthcare system is all about the second stage genocide. So that when the third stage genocide occurs, which is about disease and famine, there are no hospitals, no medicines, no medics, no surgeons, no anybody who could provide assistance to treat Palestinians who are wounded. So you can see the stages that the Israelis have. I mean, it, it's open wide for the world to see. So no hospitals and no medics, this open firing system that they have, this policy of just shooting anything that moves. That's literally what it is. And so any questions about whether this is a genocide or not, it, it, it's ridiculous when you look at what the Israeli snipers are firing at children, collecting water from puddles. They fired at children today, I think, who were on the roof of a building trying to get signal on their phones just to contact relatives to say they were OK. These, these are the targets. So, 
you know, obviously they're not Hamas, they're not combatants, they're not militants. They're, these are just children trying to collect water or scavenge for firewood or food. So yes, it's it's the most hideous genocide that, that's happening in real time that the world is just simply ignoring. And you're right, any other time it would be headline news. Of course it would. But because, uh, and, if, and Palestinians have said, you know, we're not being treated as, as human beings like from the world. And, and this would be true. They're not being given the same respect that any other human being would have. They are being targeted and they are being wiped out and erased and killed day by day, drip by drip, one by one. And the world still does nothing. Yes, uh, for, for all that it may be a defensible position, politically, and we hear it endlessly from Western leaders that Israel has a right to defend itself. I mean, I lost count of the number of times I've heard that, um, and that this uh, impossible goal of um, destroying Hamas completely must be pursued to the very end. Nevertheless, one would hope that uh, Western politicians spoke out against this degree of uh, wanton murder, um, war crimes, and, you know, yet there's silence. So it's sort of like uh, Israel has been given a license to do this by cowardly politicians, frankly, uh, in Washington, Brussels, London, and everywhere else, who only come out with the most milk toast statements absolutely meaningless that Israel must do more to protect civilians with absolutely no consequences whatsoever when it doesn't do so. Yes, absolutely. You've even had the ridiculous statement from Biden today that uh, the Israelis had somehow gone over the top. And um, I was trying to sort of reply to that. So what is under the top? Is killing yeah. just 50,000 civilians uh, is that enough or is there a number, is there a cap that, that the Americans had in mind? But they've just secured more funding to pay for more weapons, to increase the stockpile, to facilitate the genocide and allow it to continue. So uh, while they're in discussions with a so-called ceasefire that may only be so many days long, 45 or 100 and whatever it is, uh, which means technically that gives the Israelis time to, to re replenish their depleted uh, weapons stock. So yeah, it's all lip service. And you know, Britain, Britain's very deeply complicit and always has been, but Britain yes. is actually invested. You know, we have eight Israeli weapons factories, eight Elbit systems on our soil. Uh, we also have BAE systems and Lockheed Martin. These are all making huge profits out of this genocide. So, so our uh, government is very invested in these weapons firms. So technically they're making money out of the bloodshed and the carnage that the Israelis are causing. So asking them to uh, speak up for the Palestinians, asking them to put a stop on what is the most hideous genocide, I, can even, I, I can't even put it into words, asking them to um, halt it in any way or to adhere to a very weak ICJ ruling is is just one step beyond i just you know we, we can't rely on governments which is why you know we've been trying to campaign outside of governments because we can't wait on our leaders to put a halt to something that they're invested in it, you know you can see that it doesn't make sense they're invested in the ben gurion canal they're invested in the the closure of the suez canal they're invested in weapons they're invested in a genocide so yeah asking them to then come on side and support these besieged people who are in a state of being genocided, if I can use that word, um, it, it, it just falls on deaf ears. Uh, Rishi Sunak, the man masquerading as Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, unelected, of course, seems to be one of the most dyed-in-the-wool Zionists in the whole terrible history of British Prime Ministers, to be perfectly honest, and uh, seemed to double down uh, introducing new legislation to combat protests, uh, protests against genocide. We're really in a very, very dystopian place. I can't help thinking that he's done that in response to the uh, Employment Tribunal's decision to uphold Professor Miller's unfair dismissal claim. It seems like that was a bit of a, a counter move. Um, 
Similarly, of course, we had the absolute nonsense coming out of Tel Aviv about Hamas being uh, effectively the same thing as the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, uh, which on the basis of no evidence whatsoever uh, has caused various countries, including the United States, to, to immediately stop their aid. We'll come back to that in a moment. But first, uh, it's two weeks to the day since that ICJ ruling. Um, a lot of us were you know, heavily invested in it, thought, this is going to be a tremendous step in the right direction. Uh, this may actually bring a stop to the bloodshed. This will surely cause uh, the United States and the United Kingdom to stay their hand, to call for a ceasefire themselves. But none of it. Uh, it's as if the ICJ doesn't exist. It's been completely and utterly ignored. I think... It was an unprecedented thing to happen to get the Israeli regime into the dock and for genocide to be discussed in a courtroom. That in itself was unprecedented. However, the actual ICJ ruling has made no difference at all. And the reason it's made no difference is because it was as it was lame. Um, one of the stipulations in the ruling was that uh, the Palestinians must have some sort of humanitarian assistance. And it's a very, very clever little stipulation that's gone over the heads of a lot of people. What that means is that one nurse can go into an area in central Gaza or northern Gaza for six hours and go, oh, all's OK here and leave. That is humanitarian assistance. It's not food aid. It's not medical aid. It's not actually uh, medical equipment. All it is could mean one semi-qualified medic going in for a few hours and coming out again. And then they've covered that stipulation. So you can see actually how biased towards the Israeli genocide it was. It wasn't solving anything, but it was giving little sound bites that sounded good. Um, this is sort of preventative measures, the whole aspect of where well, you're in a week's time or in 30 days time, come back. And if you're still killing people, then we'll review it. That technically gave the Israelis uh, a carte blanche to carry on massacring Palestinian people for, for that 30 days. So the stipulations were incredibly cleverly put, but meant nothing. And I think it even went over a lot of people's head. This whole humanitarian assistance thing sounds like you've got to allow aid in. You've got to assist those Palestinians that have survived but are wounded and need emergency treatment. It doesn't. It means sending one medic into the area and he doesn't have to or she doesn't have to stay very long as long as that medic gets there. And, and when you kind of start pulling it apart, you realize, hang on, this wasn't to halt a genocide. Much as South Africa were uh, absolutely brilliant. I'm, I, I hail South Africa for what they did. The actual ruling itself, yes, it's been ignored. Um, we kind of knew that the Israelis would probably ignore it, but countries have almost just washed their hands of the idea that they have to now go back in and maybe a, another case has to be issued against them. That That was kind of what they wanted. Just that little bit of stipulation here and there, but actually it solves nothing. And um, here we are, we've, we've had several... I don't know how many people have been killed, actually. Since the ICJ ruling, there's probably over a thousand people. So I don't know the exact numbers, but the massacres have continued. The genocide continues. Nothing stopped. Nothing's changed. It's, it's continued just as it was before. If anything, it's being escalated now. And when you force like 1.9 million people into live in this tiny area, you've then got fish in a barrel. And so the Israeli threat to annihilate that part of Rafah, no wonder Palestinians are scared. They've got nowhere to run. They've been everywhere and everywhere else is destroyed. So, yeah, um, very disappointed in, in what happened with the ICJ ruling, but very happy that it was made. And even more disappointed with the total inaction from the ICC. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more from Sarah Wilkinson and myself on the crisis in Gaza. Uh, at the top of the programme, sir, I highlighted one atrocity, and uh, I'm afraid to say I now wish to highlight another one uh, before it's completely memory hold, which was the discovery of 30 corpses in black bin liners in a mass grave near the Hamad school in northern Gaza, uh, where the civilians appear to have been executed uh, 
without any obviously due process or anything blindfolded and handcuffed uh the palestinian north officials are demanding an inquiry into this do you think that once the shooting finally stops we will have any kind of proper united nations style investigation into these innumerable war crimes and atrocities with subsequent penalties uh and uh punitive action taking against culprits in one word no i think we're going to see a lot more of, the, of um, these um, corpses that they found. There's going to be a lot more. I think the crimes that the Israelis have been committing, being that we've had several communications, telecommunications blackouts, being that uh, many Palestinians no longer have network or phones and they're no longer able to report, and being that journalists have been such a major target, and some have left, some many have been killed. I think that you will find some of these atrocities are going to become many. You know, that yes, this mass grave has been un un uncovered, sorry, I should say, um, but I think you're going to find that there's many more. And every atrocity that the Israelis are com committing, like shooting and bombing schools, hospitals, um, you know, what happened in Al Nasser Hospital yesterday, Al Shifa Hospital, was, which was um, a, just war crime after war crime after war crime. I think that um, I would doubt that uh, the Palestinians will ever see real justice. I, th I think that if we can end the genocide and they can start rebuilding, which is a difficult one, because there's a fourth stage genocide that we haven't really talked about and isn't talked about by the media, and that is the one where um, the women uh, give birth to children with birth defects because of the chemicals, because of the weapons, because of the trauma, the complex PTSD. Um, and also uh, young children are so traumatized and so scarred that to actually build your community back up from this is going to be very difficult. There's so many women that have had hysterectomies in order to save their lives, and they're in their early 20s. So building back Palestine from this genocide is even harder than I like I say no one is really talking about this and it was a pediatrician in Jordan who uh, reminded me of this this fourth stage that despite we may end up with a ceasefire despite everything could be halted what it will take to rebuild Gaza is, is probably about 30 or 40 years maybe longer but what will happen from here on is that families and and if you think how many orphans there are um families are i have to start again from ground zero literally even even with their with their families and they have scarred traumatized children who may grow up and not be able to have families so that fourth stage genocide doesn't really get talked about a lot but the birth defects are coming and this hasn't happened yet and we don't know what biochemical warfare uh the israelis have been using we don't really know what the long-term effects we know that 30 israeli soldiers have contracted some lethal virus which could possibly be biochemical warfare which they'll never admit to uh they were talking about it being a fungus but you know like it seems that something has backfired here the israelis have contracted a virus which actually they've now taken out of Gaza and could end up, because it is contagious, could end up being a pandemic. So the, the fourth stage genocide could actually involve us all. We don't really know. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how we build again. I don't know how we finish. I don't know how we start again. And I don't think the Palestinians will ever get the justice that they deserve. I think um, just getting a ceasefire at the moment is the immediate focus. Um, and then we go from there. We, we, we rebuild somehow from there. But at the moment, I think it's an unknown quantity. I, I uh, can fully understand your pessimism about the case of justice in the long term. I'm slightly more optimistic. I hope for some kind of general political revolution, if I can use the term globally, um, which I think is long since overdue. I think populations across Western Europe and the United States are heartily sick of the way their uh, 
politics is run, basically, and the malign influence of Israel has at last been brought to the surface. Um, and more and more people are aware of it and just how they've been browbeaten and brainwashed into supporting this homicidal maniac state. There's no other way to describe it. Particularly encouraging is the number of young Jewish people in the United States who've woken up to the fact that Israel is simply a monster. So, as I said just before the headlines, the, um, I don't have the exact statistics to hand, but um, it would appear that Israel has been actually deliberately targeting academics and the cultural aspects of Palestinian life. Obviously, it's destroyed all the mosques, all the schools, all the libraries, all the universities have been simply razed to the ground nothing to do with Hamas. Uh, and in terms of the assassinations, it seems that they've been particularly going after medics, cultural leaders, academics, and in particular journalists. Yeah, the, the medics is part of the destruction of the healthcare system. So that's a second stage genocide. The um, scholars and academics, writers and journalists, that's something else. That is uh, how Palestinians communicate to the world. The voice of Palestine comes through the writers, um, journalists, reporters, TV presenters. That's how we obtain information. And I myself had 12 uh, journalists, sort of uh, amateur journalists, but they were sort of working in the background, providing me with information. They've all been killed. I lost every single one. Um, so in order to Ooh. eradicate people Ooh. finding out or learning about what was happening firsthand, they've had to go after the journalists. They've had to go after the people who spread the news. So it's not really part of the genocide, but it's certainly part of erasing cultural academia, everything to do with Palestine that, that we learn about, that you know we're informed about, and to take away the people who could help build up another resistance movement. In the 1948 Nakba, when everybody fled, the ones who were able to get out were the academics, the ones who had a little bit more money, they had the ability to leave. The ones that were left were more subsistence farmers. And it took 30 years for a Palestinian movement to really uh, take hold. And it, and it has taken hold of the country and, it, and it's a very effective movement, but it took a whole generation of young people to learn about their history, to learn about the Nakba, to grow up and become part of a, a resistance that that you know was substantial. So 30 years that took. Now, in this genocide, you're seeing very much a similar pattern. They've targeted the academics, the writers, the artists, the musicians, the journalists, the TV presenters. They've targeted everybody who could help to build a resistance movement, help to tell the story, help to put the articles together, to edit, to, you know, to get stuff into the outside world. So they've literally targeted anybody who could tell the story. Um, and they haven't finished. Um, and so you, you can kind of see the pattern that the Israelis are using. Yes, I understand the medics and, and the doctors and the surgeons and the gynecologists, all of those people that they have slaughtered, that's purely to break down a healthcare system to make sure that no wounded Palestinian can be treated properly. Children being treated without anesthetic in 2024 creates, uh, if they survive, and actually many of the children did not survive the operation, but what you do when you when you uh, mentally scar a child is that you you dis disable them from growing up without this sort of complex PTSD, without the ability to to earn a living, to go forward. You you mentally scar them. You psychologically scar them. So so that's a different aspect of the genocide. But all mashed into one. Uh, what we're seeing is just everybody of any standing, anybody with any letters after their name, anybody with any qualifications or any ability to spread the word has been a target. So that's not Hamas. That's not combatants. And how the world can't see this pattern when it's actually it's so visible to the rest of us is or whether it, it it's refusing to look at the pattern, I think is outrageous i think it's shameful i think 2023 2024 we're just never going to get over these years i i'm finding it hard to live in a world that um allows a genocide to take place now 
I, I don't know how to go forward. And that that's they're calling that sort of secondary PTSD when everybody, people of the world watching this don't quite know how to live their lives. I don't know how to go down the shop anymore. I don't know how to exist. I don't know how to work because I've always got this thing in the background where my leaders have funded, um, facilitated, organized and mobilized to allow a genocide to take place in 2024. That makes it very difficult for the rest of us. So it's this is a worldwide attack on everyone. Obviously, the Palestinians are the ones that are suffering the most, but it's a worldwide attack, attack on the stability of everybody. How do we move on from this? And I don't have the answer to that before you ask me. No, I, I hear you and, and I agree. It's um, a worldwide trauma and that trauma is worsened by the absence of sufficient outrage in the mainstream media and from so-called, you know, mainstream politicians. Uh, we do see demonstrations calling for ceasefires around the world on a daily basis, whether it's the die-in at the library at the University of Cornell or protesters in the streets in New York, in Manchester, Bristol, you name it. Every day there are more demonstrations, and I'm very pleased to say that Joe Biden can't go anywhere in the United States without being interrupted. Uh, Medea Benjamin and her cohorts in Code Pink have been doing great work uh, in the United States Congress confronting uh, politicians, uh, although I think they're personally, I think they're rather mild in the way that they do so. But uh, nevertheless, it's effective and they managed to avoid getting thrown out. But uh, most depressingly, in terms of this PSYOP, there's no other way of describing it, the psychological operation um, being forced on global populations, is that, uh, you know, the likes of the BBC, Sky News, CNN, refuse to look at what is going on on the ground in Gaza. They refuse to report on what will be a nation of uh, amputated children, uh, a nation of paraplegics, of severely traumatized people. Uh, it's as if this is some kind of normal war between two roughly equal sort of forces, a bit like the war in Eastern Europe or something, where, you know, there may unfortunately be some visual casualties. This is what's called collateral damage, yada, yada. Um, and they refuse to put the microscope on the humanitarian catastrophe, it's the only way of putting it in Gaza. And the failure to do so is what people like us, if I may say so, find so challenging because it's sort of like, hang on a minute, I'm able to look at social media and see what's going on. And they're the worst images, the worst scenarios it is humanly possible to imagine. Uh, and yet uh, the mainstream news sort of seems to carry on. Oh, 168 Palestinians were killed today. And that's if it gets a mention. Hmm. I mean, we'd be lucky if they said killed. It's normally died. Yeah, I, I don't think mainstream media are refusing. Um, they're choosing. They are um, taking and editing and dumping footage that they know could make those people who are sitting on the fence um, wake up. So it's 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 kind of like a media genocide, isn't it? In that, like, yes. they are choosing to um i can't think of the word but they're they're just missing stuff out well, it's propaganda think, by omission yeah it's yeah propaganda by omission it is but uh, you know um i'm really pleased that there's actually a lot of people who are getting rid of their tv licenses they're refusing to pay on the grounds that the bbc have made such a hash of this whole situation so i'm really glad to see that there's a there's a movement if you like where people are now refusing to pay for television that doesn't tell them anything. But it, it, there's, uh, there's a phrase sort of whoops social media. We used to say whoops apocalypse, didn't we? Whoops social media. How the mainstream news can actually have the face to do this omission, to leave everything out, and then think that we can't find it on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. 
I don't know. I know that um, a lot of people have been suspended. A lot of their accounts are, are suspended because they've dared to show the real time footage. But how, you know, for the rest of us, how they think that we can look at this information coming from Gaza and then listen to the BBC and not realize that there's this huge gap missing. I don't know that that, you know, is it because they think we are really stupid? And I think people should be offended by that as well. As for leaders, the chasm between us and our leaders has grown so big that we've all become politically homeless. How do we vote for someone who abstained or voted against a ceasefire where our friends then got killed the following week, which is kind of what happened to me? How do I vote for anyone who didn't have the spinal column to vote for a ceasefire, who was so afraid of his career? Uh, we, we did give a speech to a, a politician the other day at a protest and the police said, oh no, no, it's too long. We don't really want you to say this bit. Now, if that was me, I would have said it anyway. I would have got the stuff in that was important. But what he did was, okay, it's not worth losing my career over. And so there's this, um, yeah, politicians. It, 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 it's not irritating. There are 600,000 people in northern Gaza and 1.9 million people in Rafa who are about to lose their lives and people are still worried about their careers, uh, why the BBC isn't worried about its license, I don't know. But, you know, they are self-editing so that they can sell their story. And that, in, when we see the atrocities happening, when we see people starving to death, when we see children being having their legs amputated without anesthetic, that people still think they should self-edit, I think is just a shadow of shame over the whole um, media and news industry. It, it's I know that there are smaller outlets that are telling the truth, but you know, they're shadow banned often or, you know, you you know you find that they don't exist any longer. You you post something from them and then they've been suspended, so the entire post disappears. You know that there's so much sabotage to stop the stories coming out that we need to hear, that everybody should hear. There's such an attempt to stifle this and turn it into like you said, I don't know, so a children's party. You know that that it, it's almost it comes in at the end of the news as well. It's not even like a main news item. 133 people on average killed every single day in Gaza, every single day, and most of them are children. And that doesn't make headline news. I think we should all question what we are being fed because you're not going to spoon feed me this stuff. It it's um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no, appalling. More, more, more than more than question that it's even beyond uh, sort of ordinary dystopia. One of Patrick Henningsen's guests uh, last week said we we need to get back to the the old bad. That you know, the, this new bad is off the charts. You know, um, we're going to take a short break now. When we come back, uh, we'll be hearing about Tony Blinken's abortive trip to oversee aid deliveries into Gaza. He didn't make it because protesters blocked his way. Um, latest from the Middle East, Tony Blinken, the man masquerading as Secretary of State, was forced to abandon a visit to Gaza's border to oversee aid deliveries because Israeli protesters were blocking shipments of food into the territory, this according to Haaretz. Blinken has, of course, faced fierce criticism from humanitarian groups and European allies after the US froze funding for the UNRWA, uh, in spite of the fact that there's no evidence. And the six page dossier that the Israelis presented was uh, it was decided by Channel 4 to be completely evidence free. Nevertheless, Blinken went to the Kerem Shalom crossing, uh, a reportedly planned visit was abandoned because protesters apparently linked to extremist settler groups have been disrupting aid shipments for several weeks. But they're not really linked to extremist settler groups. That Unfortunately, they really represent mainstream Israeli thinking. Do they not, Sarah? Yes, they do. Um, and also, I'm going to call it the Karem Abu Salem crossing, if I may, and not the Israeli version. Um, of course. Yes, Israeli <laughs> Israelis have been literally camping out in tents to prevent uh humanitarian aid trucks getting into 
it's not really North Gaza, but it's Central Gaza. Um, but there, there is a point about these humanitarian aid trucks is that they they have been semi sabotaged, if you like. The Israelis are not going to allow um, an enormous amount, like like baby formula, uh, tents, you know, all, all sorts of things they don't allow in. So those lorries that are carrying aid have been minimized, if you like, if that's the right word. Um, also, the the aid that is getting into the central Gaza, uh, albeit limited, you know, there's an enormous population to feed and to provide medicines for. So it's scarce. The lorries that are coming through Rafah, also the same thing has happened to them. Their loads have been checked out by Israeli uh, soldiers and most of their loads are removed. So much of the aid that has been um, stacked up in Rafah on the Egyptian side is still there and it's been there for three months. There's also four ships in Al Arish in, uh, off the Egyptian coast that have gone nowhere. Two ships full of humanitarian aid uh, have just bobbed about in the ocean for months and the other two are mobile field hospitals, um, which I believe have been used once or twice um, by helicopter, but that's it. Um, so the reason uh, we, uh, well, uh, a, a man in uh, the US called Yossi began the airdrop aid uh, for Gaza initiative was because people in the northern regions of Gaza are not getting any humanitarian aid at all. And just to give a very brief description, because it is a bit complex, the Israelis have divided Gaza into two. So when people refer to the north of Gaza, they're actually talking about central Gaza. When they're talking about the, the, the northern part of Gaza, sometimes they're talking about the northern regions of Gaza City, but they're not actually talking about northern <laughs> Gaza proper, which has uh, what I call a tank belt. So the, because it's been divided into two, it has tanks all the way across, which prevents people in northern Gaza reaching southern Gaza or central Gaza. So if, tr if, if humanitarian aid has come in through that crossing, it hasn't reached people in the northern areas because they can't get it. And if they've tried to, then Israeli snipers have shot them and killed them. We also know of a humanitarian aid truck from the United Nations in broad daylight tried to go up the coastal pass on the, uh, on the west and uh, an Israeli gunboat literally blew a missile through the middle of it. And that's in broad daylight in front of the world. So the United Nations trucks cannot cross this tank belt into northern Gaza. Nothing is getting into northern Gaza at all. So the only way that we can get food to what is 600,000, over 600,000 people is by air, is to drop it by air. So we had to go and take this airdrop aid for Gaza campaign to Jordan because Jordan has access to the airspace over Gaza. It's the only country that does. The king, uh, the crown prince and the princess have themselves piloted the planes and um, so they've worked as human shields to protect the medical supplies that they have already dropped on South Gaza. But we went to Jordan to ask the Royal Air Force if they would turn that uh, medical aid, which we now think starving people probably are beyond needing, into food aid and take it, fly it over northern Gaza. So the first food drop was done um, about four or five days ago and um, the Dutch Air Force uh, acted as a coalition um, and um, supplied GPS guided parachutes. Um, so those, that was the first food drop that's been done. There is a plane on the runway in Jordan uh, that's full of food waiting to take off. The only obstacle is the Israeli regime. So we had to go to Jordan to ask the King a very difficult ask is a very difficult question. We're asking him to pilot a flight that could easily be shot down. And bearing in mind, there's about seven people inside each plane to make the food aid drop possible. They have to push it literally off the back of the plane. We're asking seven people to put their lives at risk, to fly over northern Gaza where no other aid is reaching to make this food drop to save the lives of over half a million people. Um, and it's a really difficult ask, but the uh, Hashemite charity organization came forward with the aid. Uh, we had two or three meetings there. We were able to talk about the logistics and the mechanisms of getting food into, into northern Gaza and um, very supportive, very helpful. And we did see two food aid drops. As we came home, we learned that they'd made the first food drop. 
So, um, yeah, we, we saw so many government ministers and dignitaries and entrepreneurs and people who could make it happen. We just literally took a petition all the way to Jordan and turned it into a reality. The point now is that we are asking people for more signatures. We need uh, more names on the petition. We're not asking for money. We're not asking for donations. But the more people who sign this petition, then the more cement, if you like, we have to the campaign. Um, famine and uh, famine related disease is going to set in. We literally up against the clock. There's no way that we can get food into northern Gaza any other way but by air. And so um, fingers crossed there should be another food drop very soon. And then we may have to go back to Jordan to start organizing the others. But, but Jordan's efforts have put this, the world to shame. You know, the Jordanian king, King Abdullah II, has actually turned himself into a human shield. And if he, and also his son and his daughter. And if you can actually think about the risks that he was taking, piloting a plane that could have easily been shot out of the sky, you realize the efforts that Jordan has put to um, save the lives of the Palestinian people. Yet there are some criticisms with how Jordan is going about things, but every government has something wrong about it. And, um, I, you know, the, the, the pro-Palestinian solidarity in Jordan is probably the biggest in the world. And at no time did we have to explain why we were pro-Palestinian, why we wanted to save the lives of the Palestinian people. They were already on board. So we did a couple of television appearances, a, a radio show, um, a, a theater production, actually. We were allowed to interrupt a theater production and get everybody to scan the QR code. The more people we have on board this campaign, the more food drops we can get. So, um, yeah, I'm asking everybody just to, to find the QR code, find the petition, just sign a name. No donations, no money, no nothing else. All we want is just names. And if half a million people can march in London, I want to know where those half a million people are because I just need their names. Um, but the importance of getting this aid into northern Gaza now is absolutely paramount, whether we have a ceasefire or not. Um, we're looking at, you know, famine causing the death of hundreds and thousands of Palestinians, maybe a week, two weeks at the most. And then there's the famine related diseases, which we don't know very much about because we haven't got very many people. Very many people. In so, yeah. Yeah. Well, where can people go to sign? Do you have a website address or perhaps they can do it via your um, page on X? Yeah, it's, it's going around Twitter. Um, so um, you should be able to find it on my page, but it's also on several others. If you just put in the hashtag airdrop aid for Gaza, all of the petitions um, on everybody's accounts will come up. Just sign it. That's all you do. Just sign it. Nothing else. And um, we'll turn that into food. And we'll, with the help of the Jordan's uh, Hashemite charity organization. We're going to get that into the air and we're going to get that dropped on northern Gaza and we're not going to give up until it is, despite what Blinken says, despite the AG, uh, ICJ ruling, despite everything, we're going to get that aid dropped on northern Gaza and save the lives of the Palestinians that are literally eating, um, they're eating sewage water, they're eating grass, um, they're boiling up um, twigs and leaves in seawater. They don't have fuel. Um, so they're actually using their own clothes to make a fire. So there's no wood left now. The, the um, uh, agricultural regions in, in the buffer zones, they've, they've been turned over by Israeli bulldozers. There's nothing to make a fire with. There's nothing to eat. And babies are being given muddy water in their, their bottles to try and fill mm. them up. This is going mm. to cause the most hideous diseases. We're already looking at typhoid, cholera, shigella disease, and, um, you know, there's hepatitis A and, and measles, which are, um, you know, everything is spreading and their immune systems are very, very low because they're starving. So um, but knowing that children are eating um, dead rodents and, um, you know, seaweed and sewage water, and that is the only clean water available is literally sewage water because of the way that the groundwater has been and contaminated. Um, it, it, it's just frightening. And, and I don't actually know what happens to uh, Palestinian babies that have been fed animal fodder. This animal feed that they've been grinding into flour has hormone chemicals in it, which 
are meant to make uh, animals' uh, muscles swell, organs swell, so that they're nice and beefy for slaughter. So this is what they're feeding babies. Now, now a doctor I spoke to in Jordan says this will make the brain swell. This has, this has like knock-on effects, and none of us know what these knock-on effects are, but we, we're going to find out very soon. So um, the, it's imperative to get this food to northern Gaza. People say, oh, but aid is trickling through. Nothing is getting through. Jabalia and Birtanun and all these areas at the top. There are maps that you can look at on um, some of the, if you put in the hashtag, you will find the maps that give you the exact region where northern Gaza is, because actually people are so confused about the region. It's Even our defense minister said he was going to use a maritime trade route to get aid to northern Gaza. Uh, and I, I felt like ringing him up and going, what maritime trade routes? You know, you're going to sail a cargo ship uh, into six inches of water. But uh, yeah, anyway, um, it is so important now to get this food dropped uh it'll be the third one so we have to give jordan as much appreciation as thanks they have taken all the risks they have put themselves in the firing line and um you know if other countries came on board uh to join make a coalition if you like of aircrafts that would provide the king with some protection and his royal air force wouldn't be so exposed so we need to see uh, we know britain isn't going to do it but we need to see other countries come on board and help Jordan provide food to northern Gaza. Well, perhaps it'll be Norway, Belgium. Uh, I don't hold out much hope for Ireland, but Spain possibly. Um, you know, they could certainly be, you know, encouraged, as you say, to do so. Um, the Spanish, one of the few countries increasing its aid as a result of the appalling decision by some to cut off the UNRWA funding. Sarah Wilkinson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.